Thanks for these guys. Thanks for your word. And thanks for you. Uh, we trust and know and are confident uh, that you're present and prepared to teach us. And uh, you know what every single man in this room is facing. And God, your plan is to give them courage and hope uh, to see them through. And for some, it's one step. For some, it's one day. For some, it might just be one hour. Uh, use this time, uh, use your word, use this fellowship, uh, change our lives, and um, we'll trust you, God, to um, leave us changed because we have this time together. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Hey, guys, come on in. Thursday morning, Tuesday night, guys. Uh, good to see you. Um, a challenge for the Tuesday night guys would be, um, I was thinking about this last night, um, this whole new approach where we're doing Thursday mornings, we're doing Tuesday nights for some guys that might not be able to make it on Thursdays. I want to challenge you Tuesday night guys to give this six months, to give it a shot, to say this is something I'm going to commit myself to, um, to be a part of building. You guys are builders on Tuesday nights. You're creating something that didn't previously exist, and we see in the Bible that that's precisely what God does with men. That's why he called Adam to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife to be fruitful and multiply and to make something, create something that didn't previously exist. And that's what you're doing on Tuesday. So um, don't be casual about it. Commit and build something. Bring guys with you and create some movement and momentum uh, for Tuesday nights. We're doing a study through the book of Joshua. We're actually studying the life of Joshua and learning from uh, this man how God creates momentum in his life, how God stirs direction in, in his life and what we can learn from that. That's why it's been recorded for us. We have the details of these stories, not just to chronicle history, but to change our lives. That's why it's there. Um, I want to begin with a statement that I want you to consider that God can do whatever he wants, however he wants, and whenever he wants. You got that? It's like, am I saying amen or am I saying oh my? I mean, which, what's the, I'm not sure where to go with that. God can do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, and when, whatever he wants. Philippians chapter two, verse 12, my beloved, Paul writes, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's kind of the oh my of the amen. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Present tense verbs there, God is always working. He's always moving, he's always teaching. Um, in Joshua chapter two, we, last week, we, um, Jay did a fantastic job leading you guys. Wasn't that great how Jay led you guys last week? Jay, thank you, my brother. Um, every time I'm around Jay Henderson, I feel dumb. <laughs> He's just so smart, and you know, when I'm around him, I want to like, say smart words and, do, and, and think smart thoughts and have a smart posture. I'm so glad I spent time with Tom Dobbins because he's the other side of that. He's helpful in bringing me back to earth. <laughs> I resemble. Yes, right. So, that's why we work so well together. Um, but Joshua's preparing the people to take the land. The whole story, you know it, is a people's been called, they've been chosen, they come from Egypt, they learn how to relate to God through Exodus, they learn how to worship in Leviticus, they understand their call, they go, the spies go, the spies come back, it's great, but it's scary, and they wander, and the wandering's over. Joshua is now the new leader, the, the second generation, the children of the Exodus are now prepared to move into the land. Joshua chapter one, be strong and courageous, God's gonna work, the land is there, and sandwiched between the call and the taking of the land is this story in chapter two. If you think about it, it doesn't fit. What's the point? We get to the end of chapter one and we're so excited to take the land and we, yes, we, we wanna be strong and courageous and we wanna, we, Joshua's our leader and he commands the people and, and they're called to listen and obey and speak and meditate and uh, God's word and we're gonna trust him and ah, it's gonna be great and then, and then we 
We do the spy thing again in chapter two. We're sending spies again. Didn't we already do this? It wasn't that a colossal failure the last time we tried this. But as we're gonna see this morning, where our lives we think are going this way, so often God sends them this way. Where we expect this, we get that. But we're thinking this is gonna happen, that happens. And we see in this story that God is on a different plane doing his work, working out his life through these people in ways that are marvelous that we could never imagine. If I were telling this story, I would go from chapter one to chapter three. I wouldn't bother with chapter two. Rahab and spies and a scarlet cord. But there is treasure in this and you can see God's brilliance in it. Let's pick it up in Joshua chapter two, uh, beginning in verse one. And so Joshua, the son of Nun, he sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying, go view the land. And then when you see that phrase, go view the land, you think, oh, we just did this. Go check out Jericho, this massive fortified city. And so they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and they lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. Strange, strange beginning to this story. You know, in Numbers, when the spies went out, we had a whole big thing about who they were, how noble they were, what they offered, what they brought to the table. We knew they were the best and brightest of Israel. They were from each tribe, the most noble men. I need noble men. God needed them then. God needs them now. We don't hear about what they see. We don't hear about what they observe as their fruit or how high are the walls. Can we take it? Can we dig under? Should we go over? What is the conquest going to look like? Remember, Joshua believes that Jericho is going to be defeated by military power. Of course, aided by God, but he believes this city has to be taken. God's going to do, that's where he's thinking. God's over here doing something else with that. We'll see that in chapter 6. But all we see is spies and a prostitute named Rahab. Jericho, the king of Jericho finds out that these men are there. And you find out really quickly that uh, this story is going to take a dramatic turn. It's almost like God wants to show off here. And he wants to tell us through this story that as you imagine what your life ought to look like, imagine how he wants to to take you to places you never either wanted to go (laughs) or would ever plan to go. But in the end, they're going to say, They're going to say, not about the fruit, not about the numbers of soldiers, but that God's going to give us this place. And that's where this is different from what we saw in Numbers with the spies. So they meet Jericho, undoubtedly her house outside. They they venture their way to, to her home. There's traffic there. Things are happening. People have made all kinds of comments about why the two spies went to a prostitute's house. I don't think we need to go there. I don't believe that. I think God sent them there. Because as he's imagining a future for Israel in that land, guess what he's also doing? He's imagining a future for a little prostitute who lives on the outside walls of a city. He's imagining a future for her too. Joshua's not. You and I wouldn't be. But God is. He's working in in, in levels and in layers and in creativity that we could never imagine. And these two spies and this woman have a conversation. We'll pick it up in verse eight. So before the men lay down, because she hid them, on the roof, 
She said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. How does she know that? Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Wow. Can you imagine? They have seen, they've been, they've been wandering for 40 years. They know Jericho is this powerful, fortified, walled-in city. And for these spies to hear from this woman that we've heard what your God did, and when we heard it, our hearts melted. That's not what they expected to hear. They probably followed the path of least resistance like we do. They imagined the worst possible scenario. She's gonna tell us we're crazy to try to take this city. Because that's what you and I do. We imagine how, how this is gonna go bad. The first spice did. That's why I'm shocked we're doing the whole spy thing again. It's great, but we got no chance. Path of least resistance. I, I suck, life sucks, nothing, nothing's ever gonna work out. Uh, this, is never gonna, this is never gonna work out. And you begin to see why we have this little insert between take the land and the taking of the land, a story of a woman who hears about the power of God and says, your God is gonna take this city. It's only a matter of time. Our hearts melted at what he did. I was looking at this, asking myself, and I don't, not trying to go too crazy with this, but when's the last time that my heart melted at just the recollection of what I know God has done and what I know he's capable of doing? Or do I spend my time following that path of least resistance, deciding how it's never gonna work out. In fact, I, I'm not even gonna send spies. We tried that, fail. We're not doing that again. I, I'm not even gonna imagine how we're gonna get across that stupid river. Forget about the city, we're stuck here. And this whole, these sermons, we preach ourselves into obscurity, into weakness. And man, I'm raising the mirror because that's the world I'm living in right now. And maybe you are too. And I'm so grateful to God that he gives us this silly little story, an entire chapter in the whole Bible about a conversation between two spies who should have never been sent because we tried that once and it didn't work and the, the heart of God to reach a prostitute and her oikos to demonstrate God's heart to save and rescue while he leads his people into victory. Wow. Can you just soak in that for a second? Our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any of us because of what your God did. He is God. I mean, she's in in the land of Canaan. This is pagan territory. They don't talk like this in Jericho. But as the people are wandering, (laughs) battling, manna, water from rocks, can we trust God while he's caring for them? He's sending messages to a pagan city that he's their God too. And she said, yeah, he is. Marvelous. It's how God speaks. It's Romans 1 that, that... People are without excuse. God is revealing himself through the creation, through the testimony of their own hearts. It's hard to fathom this, but no one can say, I never had a chance to hear about Jesus because God's revealing himself all over the place. 
We're learning in Revelation, at our, we're doing that here at our church, and we're learning that as the seals and trumpets are blown and all calamity and chaos unleashed on the earth, we're seeing the heart of God to preach the gospel to millions of people. We see his saving nature. And as they move into Jericho and move into conquest, battle after battle, they're gonna need to understand and remember that God is a God who saves. And he's telling great stories. He's got one here for us today and he's telling a great story with your life. Hearts melted. The script was changed. You see, this story goes from reconnaissance, hey, what's out there? To rescue. They're spying about how it's gonna happen. And God in the background with a big smile is saying, and watch what I do to save these people. He planned rescue all along. They're thinking this, God's doing that. Isn't that a bad case of the normals in our lives? I'm thinking this. God's doing that. <laughs> I'm thinking, future, fun, let's play ball. God's saying, no, nah, surgeries and fear to teach us to trust. I don't like it. I know you don't like it. But I see God's saving heart in all this stuff. I see wedged between take the land and have the land a need to be reminded that God is melting people's hearts and melting mine. So then they strike up this deal. The spies and this lady, she wants to be saved. She knows the city's going down. <laughs> she knows it's over. <laughs> so when the conquest comes, can we, can we make a deal while well, you're gonna save my family? And they come up with this whole, lower the cord, and when they see the cord, we'll, we'll get you out. They make this deal. They believe that God wants to save her, lower the cord. The cord has been used, the scarlet cord is a metaphor for the gospel, for the blood of Christ to save people who throw the cord from their hearts, and God says, I'll save you. But we see, I wanna go all the way down to verse 22. So this whole thing's over. They make their deal. You know, verse 21, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And as they departed to verse 22 and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing then the two men returned, returned to Joshua. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Now contrast the difference between the report that the spies in numbers give, this is fruit, it's amazing, I mean, it's gonna grow great, it's beautiful, there's giants, we're seeing the problem, we're kind of assessing the, the situation, we see some good, we see some bad, and 10 of us are gonna quit. But here, and maybe it's the spies that Joshua chose, they simply come back and say, God's given it to us. It's ours. Because he's working. We met this, <laughs> we met this woman in the walls, because she lives out in the outer walls, and she said to us that they're afraid of us. <laughs> Maybe they said it while they were laughing. I mean, they're like, why are they gonna be afraid of us? We don't have a lot to offer here. Their, their hearts melted because of us. But what they said simply was, the land is ours because the Lord has gone before us. Guys, that's a promise. Can you see that? 
So figure out what your Jericho is right now. Figure it out. Think about it. The challenge. Think about that. I want this, but I'm getting that. I want to go here, but I'm going there. We all got one. We all got dozens probably. Is it possible you can imagine a response to those things that simply says, God has given me a future through these things because of who he is, not because I'm going to figure this out. It is preposterous for people in Jericho to be afraid of God's people in Israel. It's preposterous. Unless God's working, and he is. That was the report. God is moving. Guys, there's two, three things I want you to take away from this, and then we'll jump into our, our table conversations. The first thing we see is we think about why this little story is sandwiched in here. Is the first is that God loves to tell great stories. Have you noticed that? He loves to tell great stories. And your life is a story. Your, your, your story is being played out to before the world, before your family, before yourself. And is there a piece of your story, a part of who you are that can say, no matter how big the giants are or how high the walls are, God has said that city's ours. And so the larger the challenge, the greater the story. But you gotta trust. You gotta be willing to send spies. You have gotta be willing to engage with this woman who's telling them that their hearts melted and our spirits left us because your God is God. Can you imagine how powerful that was for them to hear that? The last thing on earth they expected to hear? And as we'll see in chapter six, the way this city goes down, eh, versus eh. How are we gonna take it? We don't have enough, how are we gonna get over? Here's what you're gonna do, you're gonna scream and blow some trumpets. What? God's moving, God's telling this amazing story. I love that song, Blessed Assurance. I won't sing it to you because I love you. <laughs> Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. Amen. Yes, thank you. My story is not, I was successful in business, or I have a big motor home. My story is I'm washed in the blood, and I've seen God work. See, I have enough in the rear of your mirror to say, yeah, you've been through a lot of stuff. Is this thing any different? You're gonna make it. You're gonna make it, and we're gonna tell a great story. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. The second thing that we learn, first is God loves to tell great stories. She's a great story, the spies are a great story, you're a great story. The second is God loves to rewrite people's history. That just screams off the page. In the whole Bible, Rahab is referred to as Rahab the, the harlot or the prostitute. That's her marker. You know where we see her name without that moniker on it? It's in Matthew chapter one, verse five. Rahab, she's the, dad, the mother of Boaz who's the father of Obed. Obed gives birth to Jesse, Jesse, David, all the way down to Jesus. She's not a prostitute there. She's not being defined by her past in that passage. And here she is, just like all of us, assuming that, man, I got no future, this is kind of how it's gonna be, and then something radically changes. She responds to what God has revealed and it changed her life. God's not done writing the history of your story. And I know the walls can be high and thick. The temptation to say, let's not even go there. 
The spy thing didn't work out too well before. It's thick. The temptation to quit is thick. But God's telling a story, rewriting your story. None of us are defined by what's wrong with us, and there's lots wrong with us, or defined by what's happened to us. How are we defined? Who is, who is us? We are the ones, the heirs of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. That's who we are. That's our story. That's who you are. Own it. Wear it. The other night, my, my um, don't tell him I told you this because he would be mortified, but my youngest son was, we said, you need to take out the trash. It was dark outside. Oh, no. Yeah, he didn't want to go outside in the dark. If you tell him this, I will disavow any knowledge of what I have shared. Because <laughs> he'll be in, well, he's already going to be in therapy, but he'll really be in therapy, much quicker, much quicker he'll be in therapy, but... I said, buddy, let's do this. Let's just charge the darkness together. Let's just charge it. Let's own it. Let's not be afraid of it. Let's just take it. And so that's what these spies do. They just go, they obey. You see this profound obedience in Joshua's leadership to go and see, even though it seems scary. (laughs) There's all kinds of scary things in front of all of us. But God's telling a story And maybe you need to charge, charge the darkness in your life. Face it. Show it to God and see what he does with it. Watch him work. And then the third thing just obviously is the truth that God is always working even if it seems like he's not. He's always working even if it seems like he's he's not. We may not see how all this is gonna work out just yet in this chapter, but we see a future because God has spoken to this woman. He cares about the people in Jericho. He's gonna save some of them because that's how he works. Sometimes it's hard to see it. Okay, we're gonna go spy the land again, all right. And we'll see what we see, but turns out it's not about what they see, it's who they meet and what God wants to do through this woman's life. So can you trust that there's a stirring of the spirit all the time. He's always working, always teaching, always leading, always speaking. And even if you're in your car by yourself and it's just you and your steering wheel and you need to have some honest conversation with your steering wheel, he's working in that too. (laughs) I hope we can trust it. I love the fact that we don't just move from be strong and courageous to let's cross the Jordan and take the city without the scenes, the interludes. And as you're planning your future in the promised land, I'm gonna show you my heart. I'm gonna save Rahab and her oikos and I'm gonna teach you to trust me. I know you wanted to go this way and I know we're going this way. I know you expected this, and you're getting that. I'm in it. I'm in it. It's going to give people an occasion to to see how you trust. People an occasion to bless you as you navigate the challenges. And you're going to see my hand if we don't quit. But too many men today are quitting. They're moving into, into... be numb. <laughs> and so I pray, if that's where you are, God would melt your heart like he melted Rahab's heart and show you that he's God. So there's these um, eternity-altering questions. I think what would have been my preference in Joshua 6 They could just read these questions and the walls of Jericho would have fallen down, right, James? They just would have fallen. Don't need to shout. That's noisy. It gives me a headache. Just read my questions. (laughs) So the first question, it's clear that Joshua was thinking recon and God was planning rescue. 
I want you to describe a time in your life when you thought you were going one direction and God took in another. I'm not even gonna ask if it's ever happened. It's happened thousands of times. Find one and share it. I think maybe your brothers would be encouraged to hear it. Why do you think God includes the story of Rahab in the Bible? Why is it there? What are you sensing? Even what are you learning from our conversation this morning? Number three, where where can someone find hope and courage in this story? What is to be learned about God that we can apply to our lives today? Find that. There are nuggets of hope and courage in this story, so I want you to find them and share them with your brothers. And what do you observe about the report given to Joshua in chapter two, verse 24? Maybe even in contrast to the one we learned about several months ago in Numbers, and then take time to share prayer requests and pray for each other. Well, God, we love you. We're grateful for this morning. Uh, I pray that you would speak through these conversations, have these guys open their hearts to each other. And I just want to go as, be as bold as I can be and ask you to have a guy say something that will just pierce and melt the heart of a brother who needs to hear it, for a guy willing to be vulnerable even to admit, God, melt my heart. And would you do that? Would you melt our hearts with who you are? And if we're traveling in space we never thought we'd travel in, would you give us the encouragement that, that, that you're working and you're our story and you're rewriting our future and you're always alive in our hearts. Encourage us now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, give me an alpha male at each table, and I'll be back at 7.30. Go for it.